This video is sponsored by Squarespace. For any aspiring content creators or business owners, Squarespace is the best way to carve out a space of your own online. Whether you're just starting out or managing an existing brand, Squarespace provides everything you need to create a beautiful website to engage with your audience, sell products, host content, and much more. With Squarespace, you don't need to be an expert at writing code. Simply select from dozens of pre-made flexible templates. Once you've found one to your liking, Squarespace's fluid engine allows you to customize your site as much or as little as you want. But if you need help with your design, you can also hire an expert designer through Squarespace to make your site the best it can possibly be. Follow the link in the description to start making your own website with your own domain name and use the promo code Rowan J. Coleman for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you once again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, on with the video. In 1965, Frank Herbert's epic science fiction novel Dune was released. Though initially rejected over 20 times by other publishers, the novel went on to receive widespread acclaim, multiple awards, and became one of, if not the best-selling science fiction novel of all time. Not only did its fantastical world, a huge ensemble of characters and inventive concepts capture the imagination of readers, but filmmakers as well. Long before blockbusters like Star Wars, the task of translating the book to the big screen was thought to be impossible. But after multiple failed attempts, in the 1980s, a movie version of this unfilmable work finally made it to the big screen. It wasn't long before various attempts were made at translating Dune into movie form. The first attempt came in the same decade the book was published, when none other than Roger Corman tried to secure the rights, aiming to shoot the movie in Turkey. This project, however, was a non-starter. The next attempt at a film production was in 1971, when the rights were optioned by producer Arthur P. Jacobs, who had produced the Planet of the Apes film franchise. He pursued Lawrence of Arabia director David Lean to helm the project. Progress was slow, however, and after Jacobs suffered a sudden fatal heart attack, the project was shelved indefinitely. In December 1974, producer Jean-Paul Gibbon purchased the rights for a new adaptation, famously to be directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky. This version of Dune has often been referred to as one of the greatest movies never made. Jodorowsky's adaptation was to be a 10-hour long feature film, with a cast that included Salvador Dali, David Carradine, Udo Kier, Mick Jagger, and Orson Welles. He had assembled a team of star concept artists, which included Jean Mobius Girard, Chris Foss, and H.R. Giger, as well as Dan O'Bannon to supervise the visual effects. While Jodorowsky's adaptation made some big departures from its source material, author Frank Herbert was said to be quite excited by the adaptation. However, due to difficulties in raising the budget and finding distribution, Jodorowsky's version never saw the light of day. The details of the outlandish production have been covered in depth in the excellent documentary Jodorowsky's Dune, which I highly recommend. It has been suggested over the years that producer Dino De Laurentiis used his influence in Hollywood to effectively sabotage Jodorowsky's adaptation in the hope of making his own. Whether this was true or not, by the time the rights became available again, De Laurentiis quickly picked them up after the Jodorowsky version collapsed. Ridley Scott was brought on to direct in 1979 following the success of Alien, which H.R. Giger and Dan O'Bannon also worked on. Frank Herbert himself was hired to write a draft of the screenplay, but he admittedly found writing for the screen quite difficult, and turned in his draft which was 175 pages long. As a new, shorter draft was being written, Ridley Scott had to drop out of the project due to the sudden death of his older brother. Dropping out of Dune would eventually lead Scott to directing Blade Runner. The next director who caught De Laurentiis' eye was not a blockbuster filmmaker, but David Lynch best known at the time for directing The Elephant Man. Off the back of Elephant Man's success, George Lucas had offered Lynch the chance to direct The Return of the Jedi, which Lynch declined, having little interest in the job. Dune, however, intrigued him. The day I finished reading the book, I met with Dino in his office, and I was so high from finishing the books and so thrilled with you know, what I'd read, I signed on. He initially worked with two co-writers, but as development continued, Lynch became sole writer and director. 
Once Dune was up and running with the director, Dino De Laurentiis actually handed over much of the day-to-day -day work of running the production over to his daughter, Rafaela De Laurentiis. At 32 years old, she was one of the youngest female producers working in the industry at the time, though she was unaware of this. I think when you're young, um, ignorance of sometimes make you achieve greatness because you just don't know any better, and so you say, okay, well, so sure, I'll produce Dune. I want to produce Dune. Then, you know, it's only 10 years later that I found out that no woman had ever, had ever produced before Dune um, uh, any th movie who, that the budget was um, over $5 million. I had no idea. For the production design of the film, Anthony Masters, the Oscar-winning designer of 2001 A Space Odyssey, was brought on board. Masters had been asked by George Lucas to work on Star Wars, but he had to pass on the offer due to scheduling conflicts. Therefore, when Dune came along, he jumped at the chance. Although the art department had been given the concept art created for Jodorowsky's Dune and Ridley Scott's version, Masters and Lynch decided to start from scratch. They wanted Dune to look nothing like any previous science fiction film, especially Star Wars. For the costumes of the film, Lynch approached Bob Ringwood, who had worked on John Berman's Excalibur. Taking cues from Lynch, Ringwood went with a 1940s-inspired look for the film. This is especially apparent in the Atreides and Imperial costumes. The Fremen still suits were made up of foam rubber pieces, which mimicked the forms of human musculature. Full-body casts were taken of the main actors to properly fit each suit to each actor. Because much of the shoot would take place in the Mexican desert, an elaborate cooling system was built into the suit. Once the finished suits were sprayed down with dust and sand, they were ready for filming. Many actors were considered for the role of Paul Atreides, including Tom Cruise, Kevin Costner, Val Kilmer, Kenneth Branagh, and Rob Lowe. Kilmer was in fact the frontrunner for the longest time, even being fitted for blue contact lenses at one point. Eventually, then 25-year-old Kyle MacLachlan landed an audition, which impressed the producers. As it turned out, MacLachlan was an enormous fan of Dune, and before accepting the role, he interviewed David Lynch to make sure the movie would do justice to the novel. After his talk with Lynch, MacLachlan accepted the part. Playing Paul's mother, Lady Jessica, was Francesca Annis. She made another foray into science fiction, playing the Widow of the Web in Krull. To play Paul's father, Duke Leto Atreides, David Lynch was recommended German actor Jürgen Prochnow. At first, Lynch was hesitant, feeling an American actor was more appropriate. It was only after Lynch saw Prochnow in the acclaimed Das Boot did he agree Prochnow was right for the role. Dean Stockwell was another huge fan of the novel and pursued Lynch for a role in the film. John Hurt had originally been cast as Dr. Yue, but had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts, Thus, Stockwell won the role. Hollywood star Aldo Rey was originally cast as Gurney Halleck, but lost the role when he was arrested in Mexico for assault. Scrambling to find a replacement, Lynch thought of an actor he had seen in Excalibur, Patrick Stewart. This was the first production Stewart had done on the other side of the Atlantic, and relished the opportunity to work alongside his idol Max von Sydow, and became fast friends with Kyle MacLachlan. Richard Jones was brought in to read for several different parts before being cast as Swordmaster Duncan Idaho. Freddie Jones had previously appeared in Lynch's film The Elephant Man, and won the role of Thufir Howard, the Atreides Mentat. To play the leader of House Harkonnen, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, the producers initially sought out Orson Welles, who had been cast in the role for Jodorowsky's version. Welles, however, flatly refused. Paul Smith was then asked to play the part, but in order to do so, he would have to gain a lot of weight, which the actor didn't want to do. He eventually landed the role of the Beast Raban. Instead, the producers approached Kenneth Macmillan for the role, which he happily accepted. To play the Baron, Macmillan wore a bulky fat suit, which made it virtually impossible for the actor to walk. Macmillan only managed a shuffle at most. Dune's casting director was already acquainted with musician and singer Sting, after he auditioned for a Francis Ford Coppola-produced project, which never got off the ground. When it came time to cast the Baron's nephew, Fade, Sting was offered the part, which he accepted enthusiastically. Famously, Patrick Stewart apparently had no idea who Sting was. Because I'd been there a couple of weeks before Sting arrived, and when he arrived, <gasps> there was this kind of frisson everywhere, you know, the whole of Mexico City was a buzz that Sting was coming. 
and so the second or third day, we're just hanging out on the set, and him and me, and I say, so you're a musician? And he said, yep. And I said, what do you play? <laughs> and I swear, I swear, I crossed my heart. And, <laughs> and, and he said, bass. And I said, you know, I've often wondered, what is it like carrying that huge thing around with <laughs> everywhere you go? And, <laughs> and it, you're like, are you a solo artist? And he said, no, 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 I'm in a band. And I said, oh, what kind of band? He said, the police. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> I said, you play in a police band. <laughs> Brad Dourif made his first of many appearances in the sci-fi genre as the Harkonnen mentat Piter. Jack Nance, who had previously played the lead in Lynch's feature debut Eraserhead, was cast as the Harkonnen guard Captain Nefud. Everett McGill was initially brought in for a much smaller role, but his agent convinced the producers to audition McGill for the Fremen leader Stilgar. He won the role soon after. Sean Young, who was an up-and-coming star at the time, landed an audition to play Shani, but due to some scheduling confusion, missed the appointment. It was only thanks to a chance encounter with Dino and Raffaella on a plane later that day that she convinced them she could take on the role. Playing Paul's younger sister, Aaliyah, was then five-year-old Alicia Witt. Despite how young she was, Witt was apparently able to grasp the dialogue quite easily and enjoyed her time on the production. Making up the members of the ruling House Carino was Virginia Madsen as Princess Irulan, and playing the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV was award-winning actor and director José Ferrer. Acclaimed Swedish actor Max von Sydow had previously worked with De Laurentiis as Ming the Merciless in Flash Gordon. He was cast as Dr. Kynes, the Imperial Ecologist. And finally, Welsh actress Sean Phillips was cast as the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother. Filming took place mostly at Cherubusco Studios in Mexico City. A total of 80 sets were built across 16 sound stages, essentially taking over the entire complex. A three-square-mile area of nearby desert was also cleared of vegetation, rocks, and wildlife for location filming. Despite the sweltering heat in the desert and the complexities of studio filming, spirits were generally high during production. The cast and crew were very passionate about the material, with each department having a copy of the original novel on hand at all times. To make the Baron fly, the special effects crew used a combination of wire work and crane arms. Extremely thin tungsten steel wires were used to hoist Macmillan into the air, and for close-up shots he would stand on the end of a crane. Other scenes required custom-built rigs. While a number of shots involving miniatures were completed in post-production, in-camera foreground miniatures were also used extensively. Partial sets were built at the Mexico City Stadium, which were then extended by large miniatures which lined up with the sets. This often meant mounting the camera on a platform a dozen or so meters high. You would have a wall that's a real wall, built full size, and then he would come up and do his little teeny wall with all the details. Now, one is right here next to the camera, one is down there, but your eye is going to put them together, but it takes a, an eye to do that. While some motion-controlled cameras were used for a handful of optical composites, a great many miniature effect shots were captured entirely in camera. The destruction of Arakeen, the Spice Harvester explosion, and many of the sandworm shots were fully in camera. The worms themselves were elaborate puppets of various different scales. The worms proved extremely difficult to operate, and getting usable footage from the worm sequences was very challenging. To achieve the correct scale for the sand, the miniature team actually had to use incredibly small glass particles. Because this substance was dangerous to breathe, the crew often had to wear full PPE while working on the stage. For the personal shields, computer graphics were initially proposed, but the final shots had to be hand-animated. In order to achieve the distortion effect, each surface of the shield had to be printed separately and then recomposited back together. In total, it took nine months to create the sequence. For the music of the film, De Laurentiis, perhaps inspired by Jodorowsky's notion of hiring a rock band for the score, in his case Pink Floyd, approached American rock band Toto. Toto came up with the main theme for the movie, mixing their combination of rock and electronica with an orchestra. 
Ambient music artist Brian Eno also contributed to the score, writing the Prophecy theme. When it came time to edit the film, Lynch had a three-hour cut in mind, but when this was proposed to distributor Universal Pictures, they demanded a two-hour cut instead. Lynch, along with the De Laurentiis, went through the footage cutting out a number of scenes, filming new ones and adding in some narration. While Lynch was unhappy at having to remove so much material, his preferred three-hour cut was never completed. A later extended TV version, which ran for over three hours, was later made without Lynch's approval. He requested his name be taken off this version, being credited under the infamous pseudonym Alan Smithy for director, and another pseudonym Judas Booth for writer. The editing process in general seemed to stir some doubts in Lynch, who began to wonder if he had sold out to some degree by taking on the project. Despite his trepidations, however, Dune was released on the 14th of December, 1984. Dune is a movie I have a somewhat strange relationship with. I first saw it in my early teens, and I don't remember enjoying it all that much. Yet there is something fascinating about it, something which compelled me to re-watch the film numerous times and eventually inspired me to read the book. Dune is by no means without merit. It's a passion project through and through, lovingly made by a team of incredibly talented artists who moved heaven and earth to bring Frank Herbert's story to life. But if there's one word I'd use to sum up the issues with this particular adaptation, that word is compromised. The movie is frustrating in how absolutely stunning many elements of its production are, elements which are unfortunately let down by some other factor. The miniature work is genuinely incredible, but the optical compositing is rough to say the least. None of it has the dynamism of ILM's work on Star Wars, instead feeling slow and static by comparison. The time when Dune would have really blown away an audience with its sheer presentation was many years before its actual release. And for all the money spent on it, the world of Dune feels oddly small in scope. Much of the action is confined to interiors, which feel very claustrophobic as a result of the dark cinematography. Yet the desert scenes feel disconnected from everything else. It's as if the entirety of Arrakis is a handful of sand dunes, which could be thousands of miles away from any city or right next door. The viewer never gets a solid sense of place. The geography of these worlds is never concretely established beyond the confines of the bases and fortresses the majority of scenes occupy. This problem is really emblematic of the larger issues with the film's overall direction. Now, David Lynch is a truly brilliant filmmaker, but his strengths as a director lie in atmosphere, evocative imagery, characters, and working with actors, a valuable set of skills to bring to any production. But when it comes to making an epic sci-fi blockbuster, there are other skills required which it seems Lynch lacked. That never bothered him, you know, the the 2,000 people in the back. He was worried about what was in front of his lens. And, and sometimes that's what we had problems with because, you know, I would have 2,000 extras in, in suits in the desert, and he was trying to shoot the close-up of Kyle's eye. And I said, David, you can shoot that eye, you know, in the studio anytime you want, but we got to shoot. That's why, you know, that's why we're here out in the desert. Uh, David never really worried himself about that. This is most apparent in the action sequences, which end up disjointed, prolonged, or awkwardly framed. When the Harkonnens attack Arrakis, the Baron is somehow already inside the fortress, having captured Leto, Jessica, and Paul before his army even arrives. In the final battle against the Emperor, the sequence essentially boils down to the Fremen shooting the Sardaukar from atop the sandworms until the Sardaukar run away. Where Lynch's strengths do come through, however, is with the characters and the cast. Despite Kyle MacLachlan being much older than Paul Atreides in the book, he and pretty much everyone else are perfect for their roles. MacLachlan delivers a star-making performance here, endearing, even charming during his introduction on Caladan, and totally commanding in his eventual rise to leader of the Fremen Rebellion. The supporting cast are nearly all fantastic, an ensemble of veteran stage and screen performers, elevating their relatively small parts to memorable heights. However, it's the Harkonnens who steal the show. 
Kenneth Macmillan is clearly having a blast as the Baron. Though this take on the character is a huge departure from the more subdued, calculating Baron scene in the book, Macmillan's performance as a disease-ridden, sadistic maniac makes for a villain that's truly detestable, but also thoroughly entertaining to watch. That same villainous glee is reflected in Sting's performance as Fade. Despite having very little dialogue, his constant smirking and wild eyes succeeds in building him up as a credible threat to Paul in their final duel, even though he actually does very little. There are some other uniquely Lynchian departures from the book which I actually think benefit the film. Small quirks like House Atreides having an odd affinity for pugs, the Mentats having mad eyebrows and bushy hair, and all the sickening contraptions which only serve to make House Harkonnen all the more hateable. I also think the weirding way being turned into a sonic weapon triggered by the spoken word is a pretty cool idea. Taken further, it could have led to some interesting places, but as it is, the sonic weapon concept spices up the action nicely. There are brilliant moments with almost every character in the movie. It's in these quieter moments where Lynch's Dune excels. The things which go unsaid, the dream sequences, the time when Dune embraces the truly weird and trippy. These are the times where the viewer can really soak up the film's unique atmosphere, which is bolstered by the excellent score. Toto's main theme is suitably epic with its punchy brass and drums, but also ethereal with its synthesizers and electric guitar. It delivers that epic sci-fi sound which the music of Star Trek and Star Wars are known for, but with its own distinct, darker flavour. Brian Eno's work is also just as memorable for its meditative quality. His prophecy theme sounds truly transcendent. It's a shame though the moments where Dune works are often hampered by the incessant narration. I'm just a seeker. Can't get me if I don't move. It's too dark in here for it to see clearly. Dune's problem is not that it doesn't explain its world properly, rather, the film explains too much. The feudal system of the Imperium, why spice is important, the Emperor's conspiracy and the Spacing Guild's involvement, weirding modules, still suit, hunter seekers, the water of life, it's all covered to death, either in the dialogue between the characters or by each character's own internal monologue. Far off in the control rooms of spice gas, traveling. Without moving. What's especially annoying is when this narration is used to convey information which is clearly evident in the performances of the cast. We can see Jessica's relief that Paul survived the Reverend Mother's test, we can see Kynes being impressed by Leto's compassion, and yet the narration makes sure to clarify these things when there's no need. My son lives. I must admit, against all better judgement, I like this Duke. It leaves nothing left to the audience to intuit, making it difficult for the viewer to become engrossed in the drama. Overall, it's fair to say Dune lacks excitement. It lacks a dramatic tension to propel the events forward. The fall of House Atreides is tragic, even shocking, but not very affecting. The second act where Paul and Jessica are taken in by the Fremen is more compelling. Paul's first ride on the sandworm is a real highlight of the film. Unfortunately, the sudden time jump at the start of the third act is almost whiplash-inducing. The real casualties here are Stilgar and Chani. We see the start of Paul and Stilgar's friendship forming, but the film skips over most of their actual relationship. Chani, for all her importance, barely factors into the film at all. Ultimately, Dune is too much novel to fit into one film without making some seriously big changes to the narrative. It may sound as though I'm being overly negative towards Dune, but as I said, there is something which keeps bringing me back to it. In a way, my relationship to the film is similar to Star Trek The Motion Picture. I'm aware of its flaws, but I can engage with the movie when I'm in the right headspace. The storytelling may not be very strong, but the imagery, atmosphere, and characters are what stay with you. A work of passion that fails will always be more admirable than a successful work of complacency. It did achieve one major thing for me personally, which is getting me to read the book. It expanded my horizons and inspired my imagination. The movie, for all of its problems, did succeed in capturing the spirit of Dune. In the lead-up to the movie's release, De Laurentiis and Universal made a strong marketing push. 
In a possible attempt at replicating the success of Star Wars, a line of tie-in action figures was produced by LJN. However, like many LJN products, these toys were poorly made and only managed lackluster sales, something which didn't bode well for the movie itself. Upon release, Dune received largely negative reviews from critics. Many lambasted it as borderline incomprehensible and off-putting, and the film didn't fare much better at the box office. On a large budget of $45 million, Dune only managed to gross $30 million worldwide, making it a considerable box office bomb. While it did receive some accolades, such as an Oscar nomination for Best Visual Effects, Dune was widely regarded as a failure. The poor performance of the film was most keenly felt by David Lynch himself. For a time, he withdrew into seclusion, feeling chiefly responsible for the movie's failure. In retrospect, he believed he had sold out in making the film in the first place, and vowed never to work on such a project again. Dune is a huge, gigantic sadness in my life because I did not have final cut on that film, total creative control I didn't have. So uh, the film is not the film that I would have made had I had that final control. So it's a bit of a sadness, and uh, but I'm still happy that you like it. And... <laughs> I like many, many parts of Dune myself. Despite its largely negative reception at the time, this first crack at adapting Dune to the big screen it did accrue a passionate cult fan base over the years. Although it may have been a flop at the box office and with critics, for many fans of the book, this was the definitive version of Dune outside the source material. This, I think, is one of the, is one of the linchpins of Dune's importance. That it ever actually got made. It was a book that shouldn't have been shot. It was a script that couldn't have been written. It was a directorial job that was beyond anyone's doing. It was a production that would beggar the imagination and bankrupt three studios. It was a production that could not possibly be marketed in any way that anyone could understand or that they would go to. It didn't hit its audience. It looked like it insulted its audience. It looked like it defamed its, its, its uh, originator. And yet, the film was made. In fact, it was believed this fan base was strong enough that in the 90s, the video games Dune 2 and Dune 2000 were released. As pioneering works in the real-time strategy genre, these games heavily leaned into the 84 movies look and feel, especially in Dune 2000's FMV cutscene. Over the years, many fan edits of the movie have been made, which attempt to restore some of the cut content, rearrange existing footage, or add new material to do justice to what Lynch had originally envisioned for the film. How successful these new cuts are in improving the film could be the subject of another video, but I think the efforts by fans to expand on the original film are commendable. Of course, more recently, Dune has returned to the big screen in the form of the two-part epic directed by Denis Villeneuve. In contrast to the 1984 version, Dune Part 1 was a critical and commercial success, with Part 2 slated for release later this year at the time of writing. But even with this version, some still see the Lynch film as definitive. However, there were other Dune adaptations before Villeneuve made his stamp on the mythos. After the 1984 film, the next attempt at bringing Frank Herbert's world to life came in the year 2000. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share to stay up to date on all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, jump over to my Patreon where you can see videos early, uncut, and ad-free. Speaking of which, I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons and members now appearing on screen, with an ultra thanks to Stacked, Tom, Dusk, Colin Camille, Patrick Fleming, Matthew Camille, Ed Mark Starr, Dylan Thomas, Lilac Yane, Howard Craig Akervik, and Kajing G. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.